Thanks largely to Freedom of Information Act litigation brought by the ACLU and to the work of scores of individual writers, journalists, and bloggers. And thanks too to the growing number of men and women who fought against this from the inside and have now come forward. We know much more about the torture and abuse of detainees today. One day, we'll know more. But we know enough already to begin a reckoning with American torture. Sometimes it takes a great writer to pin down your feelings. I, like many of you, was indignant when I first heard about these things. But as an American, an American by choice, I also felt shame at what had been done in our name. I understood my own response better when I read these words from J.M. Katsir's 2007 novel, Diary of a Bad Year. A few years ago, I heard a performance, a few days ago, I heard a performance of Sibelius's Fifth Symphony. As the closing bars approached, I experienced exactly the large swelling emotion that the music was meant to elicit. What would it have been like, I wondered, to be a Finn in the audience at the first performance of the symphony in Helsinki nearly a century ago and feel that swell overtake me? The answer, one would have felt proud. Proud that one of us could put together such sounds. Proud that out of nothing, we human beings can make such stuff. Contrast with that one's feelings of shame that we, our people, have made Guantanamo. Musical creation on the one hand, a machine for inflicting pain and humiliation on the other. The best and the worst that human beings are capable of. Penn believes writers play an important role at moments like this, when societies are struggling to come to terms with evidence of human rights abuses. Shame, as an American, is met by pride in this work of my fellow writers, and with pride, too, that the leading voices raised against these abuses have been as American, dare I say more American, than the men who led us into this quagmire. As writers and as citizens, we can help not only to uncover what happened, but also to begin the process of trying to decide what it all means. Hope you'll take a minute to visit pen.org and aclu.org and learn more about what's going on and what our members are doing to promote accountability and advance the process of reflection and reparation. And I hope you will want to help support us in our work. And as with all things, a good place to start is by reading the record. And that's what tonight's program does. I'm very grateful to the extraordinary group that's gathered tonight to help us read just a few passages from the Mountain of Memos and other documents and testimonials that's been assembled over the past few years. Their presence tonight, and yours, is a strong statement in itself about how important we all feel it is that these words be heard. So thank you again for coming. And please join me in welcoming Jamil Jaffa, director of ACLU's National Security Project. Thanks, and, and thank you all for coming tonight. So some of the documents that you're going to, to, to hear this evening are, are documents that have been declassified uh, by the US government. And I think you'll, you'll see that the documents give you a glimpse into a torture program that was uh, endorsed and, uh, and enthusiastically defended by the Bush administration's most senior officials. One thing that, that you should keep in mind, though, is that, is that though, though some of the, this information has, has now been released and is now a matter of, of public record, there are still hundreds, thousands of documents that are still being withheld. Uh, we're now five years since the Abu Ghraib photographs were broadcast, uh, and still the, the, the Defense Department is withholding photos of abuse at prisons other than Abu Ghraib. Uh, it's, it's withholding interrogation directives used by special forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. The CIA is withholding uh, transcripts in which CIA prisoners describe the abuse that they, they suffered at, at the hands of CIA interrogators. The CIA is also withholding large portions of an inspector general report that's sort of crucial to the, uh, to the story. So there's a lot of information that's still being withheld. And if it's remarkable how much information is still being withheld, I think it's even more remarkable how little has been done with the information that, that has already been released. In spite of the information that's been released, there is no congressional investigation into the roots of the torture program. Uh, there's, a, there's now a criminal investigation, but the criminal investigation is narrowly circumscribed. 
Congress, uh, rather than investigating the torture program, is, is doing just the opposite. It's now considering a bill that would allow the Defense Department to suppress evidence of torture. So there's still, there's still a lot to do. We're hoping that events like this one will help build public support for a more comprehensive investigation of the Bush administration's torture program. And President Obama, as you know, has said that we should look forward and not back. Uh, but in our view, that's a false choice. While it's crucial that we adopt new policies for the future, that doesn't allow us to disregard the abuses of the past. And restoring the rule of law is going to require finally confronting uh, those gross, gross human rights abuses of the Bush administration. On behalf of the ACLU, I'd like to thank Pan American Center, the Cooper Union, Jenny Holzer, and all of the readers. Uh, and thanks again to all of you for coming tonight. Hi, I'm Nell Freudenberger. This is a sworn statement from an interrogator at the Kandahar Detention Facility in Afghanistan. It's from the 13th of February, 2002. I'm writing this in response to events that I witnessed while performing my duties as an interrogator with the Task Force 202 JIF. Specialist Blank and I were conducting an interrogation of military prisoner number Blank on the 3rd of January, 2002. Special Forces personnel had been visiting the booth area previously and helping out by giving information that they had from their raids. Blank and I took a break to regroup and check our notes. I was the translator. While we were out of the booth, several Special Forces members entered the booth. At the time, I did not think anything of it and thought they were just observing him based on previous experiences with their people. This was a different group of Special Forces people I hadn't seen before. Blank and I finished the break and went back to continue the interrogation. When we entered the booth, we found the Special Forces members all crouched around the prisoner. They were blowing cigarette smoke in his face. The prisoner was extremely upset. It took a long time to calm him down and find out what had happened. The prisoner was visibly shaken and crying. Blank immediately told them to get out and not to come back anywhere near anyone that we were talking to. I could tell something was wrong. The prisoner was extremely upset. He said that they had hit him, told him that he was going to die, blew smoke in his face, and had shocked him with some kind of device. He used the term electricity. I immediately notified our non-commissioned officer in charge of what had happened. I was very upset that such a thing could happen. I take my job and responsibilities as an interrogator and as a human being very seriously. I understand the importance of the Geneva Convention and what it represents. If I don't honor it, what right do I have to expect any other military to do so? I'm going to read from a memo prepared by the CIA and sent to the Department of Justice on December 30, 2004. The cover letter of the memo reads, Dan, a general description of the process, thank you. <clears throat> The purpose of interrogation is to persuade high-value detainees, HVD, to provide threat information and terrorist intelligence in a timely manner, to allow the U.S. government to identify and disrupt terrorist plots. Here, several words are redacted. And to collect critical intelligence on al-Qaeda. Here, several lines are redacted. Effective interrogation is based on the concept of using both physical and psychological pressures in a comprehensive, systematic, and cumulative manner to influence HVD behavior, to overcome a detainee's resistance posture. The goal of interrogation is to create a state of learned helplessness and dependence, conducive to the collection of intelligence in a predictable, reliable, and sustainable manner. For the purpose of this paper, the interrogation process can be broken into three separate phases, initial conditions, transition to interrogation, and interrogation. A, initial conditions, capture, here several words are redacted, contribute to the physical and psychological condition of the HVD prior to the start of interrogation. Of these, Capture shock and detainee reactions, redacted, are factors that may vary significantly between detainees. 
Here, three lines are redacted. Regardless of their previous environment and experiences, once an HVD is turned over to CIA, a predictable set of events occur. One, rendition. The HVD is flown to a black site, redacted. A medical examination is conducted prior to the flight. During the flight, the detainee is securely shackled and is deprived of light and sound through the use of blindfolds, earmuffs, and hoods. Here, one line is redacted. There is no interaction with the HVD during this rendition movement, except for periodic, discrete assessments by the onboard medical officer. B, upon arrival at the destination airfield, the HVD is moved to the black site under the same conditions and using appropriate security procedures. Two, reception at black site. The HVD is subjected to administrative procedures and medical assessment upon arrival at the black site. Five lines are redacted. The HVD finds himself in the complete control of Americans. Six lines are redacted. The procedures he is subjected to are precise, quiet, and almost clinical, and no one is mistreating him. While each HVD is different, the rendition and reception process generally creates significant apprehension in the HVD because of the enormity and suddenness of the change in environment, the uncertainty about what will happen next, and the potential dread an HVD might have of US custody. Reception procedures include, A, the HVD's head and face are shaved, B, a series of photographs are taken of the HVD while nude to document the physical condition of the HVD upon arrival. C, a medical officer interviews the HVD and a medical evaluation is conducted to assess the physical condition of the HVD. The medical officer also determines if there are any contraindications to the use of interrogation techniques. D. A psychologist interviews the HVD to assess his mental state. The psychologist also determines if there are any contraindications to the use of interrogation techniques. Transitioning the interrogation, the initial interview. Interrogators use the initial interview to assess the initial resistance posture of the HVD and to determine in a relatively benign environment if the HVD intends to willingly participate with CIA interrogators. The standard on participation is set very high during the initial interview. The HVD would have to willingly provide information on actionable threats and location information on high value targets at large, not lower level information, for interrogators to continue with the neutral approach. The rest of the page is redacted. Hi, I'm, I'm David Cole. Um, I teach constitutional law at uh, Georgetown, and I'm the author of a book called The Torture Memos. Uh, I want to make it clear I'm not the author of The Torture Memos uh, themselves, but uh, tonight I will be reading uh, from uh, one of those torture memos, impersonating uh, a person some of you may have heard of uh, named John Yu, who is infamous for writing the first uh, torture memo. And you know, it's, it's not great to have to read uh, from the views of a torturer, but art has to uh, read uh, from the views of a terrorist. So I'm not sure which is a better choice. Hi, I'm Art Spiegelman. I'll be reading excerpts of Abu Zubaydah's uh, first-hand account of his interrogation in a secret CIA prison. Abu Zubaydah's testimony is included in a report by the International Committee for the Red Cross about the treatment of detainees in US custody. You have asked for this office's views on whether certain proposed conduct would violate the prohibition against torture found at section 2340A of title 18 of the United States Code. You have asked us for this advice in the course of conducting interrogations of Abu Zubaydah. In light of the information you believe Zubaydah has and the high level of threat you believe now exists, you wish to move the interrogation into what you have described as increased pressure phase. 
This phase will likely last no more than several days, but could last up to 30 days. About two and a half or three months after I arrived in this place, the interrogation began again, but with more intensity than before. Then the real torturing started. In this phase, you would like to employ 10 techniques that you believe will dislocate his expectations regarding the treatment he believes he will receive and encourage him to disclose the crucial information mentioned above. These 10, te 10 techniques are one, attention grasp, two, walling, three, facial hold, four, facial slap, insult slap, five, cramped confinement, six, wall standing, seven, stress positions, eight, sleep deprivation, nine, insects placed in a confinement box, and 10, the waterboard. You have informed us that you expect these techniques to be used in some sort of escalating fashion, culminating with the waterboard, though not necessarily ending with this technique. Two black wooden boxes were brought into the room outside my cell. One was tall, slightly higher than me, and narrow, measuring perhaps one meter by three quarters of a meter and two meters in height. The other was shorter, perhaps only one meter in height. I was taken out of my cell, and one of the interrogators wrapped a towel around my neck. They then used it to swing me around and smash me repeatedly against the hard walls of the room. I was also repeatedly slapped in the face. As I was still shackled, the pushing and pulling around meant that the shackles pulled painfully on my ankles. Cramped confinement involves the placement of the individual in a confined space, the dimensions of which restrict the individual's movement. The confined space is usually dark. The duration of confinement varies based on the size of the container. For the larger confined space, the individual can stand up or sit down. The smaller space is large enough for the subject to sit down. Confinement to the larger space can last up to 18 hours. For the smaller space, confinement lasts for no more than two hours. I was then put into the tall box for what I think was about one and a half to two hours. The box was totally black on the inside as well as the outside. It had a bucket inside to use as a toilet and had water to drink provided in a bottle. They put a cloth of cover over the outside of the box to cut out the light and restrict my air supply. It was difficult to breathe. For walling, a flexible false wall will be constructed. The individual is placed with his heels touching the wall. The interrogator pulls the individual forward and then quickly and firmly pushes the individual into the wall. It is the individual's shoulder blades that hit the wall. During this motion, the head and neck are supported with a rolled hood or towel that provides a C-collar effect to help prevent whiplash. To further reduce the probability of injury, the individual is allowed to rebound from the flexible wall. You have orally informed us that the false wall is in part constructed to create a loud sound when the individual hits it, which will further shock or surprise the individual. In part, the idea is to create a sound that will make the impact seem far worse than it is and that will be far worse than any injury that might result from the action. When I was let out of the box, I saw that one of the walls of the room had been covered with plywood sheeting. From now on, it was against this wall that I was then smashed with the towel around my neck. I think that the plywood was there to provide some absorption of the impact of my body. The interrogators realized that smashing me against the hard wall would probably quickly result in physical injury. During these torture sessions, many guards were present, plus two interrogators who did the actual beating still asking questions, which the main interrogator left to return when the beating was over. After the beating, I was then placed in the small box. They placed a cloth or cover over the box to cut out all light and restrict my air supply. As it was not high enough even to sit upright, I had to crouch down. It was very difficult because of my wounds. The wound on my leg began to open and started to bleed. I don't know how long I remained in the small box. I think I may have slept or maybe fainted. Finally, you would like to use a technique called the waterboard. In this procedure, the individual is bound securely to an inclined bench which is approximately four feet by seven feet. The individual's feet are generally elevated. A cloth is placed over the forehead and eyes. Water is then applied to the cloth in a controlled manner. As this is done, the cloth is lowered until it covers the nose and mouth. 
Once the cloth is saturated and completely covers the mouth and nose, airflow is slightly restricted for 20 to 40 seconds due to the presence of the cloth. This causes an increase in carbon dioxide level in the individual's blood. This increase in the carbon dioxide level stimulates increased effort to breathe. This effort, plus the cloth, produce the perception of suffocation and incipient panic, i.e., the perception of drowning. During those 20 to 40 seconds, water is continuously applied from a height of 12 to 24 inches. After this period, the cloth is lifted and the individual is allowed to breathe unimpeded for three or four full breaths. The sensation of drowning is immediately relieved by the removal of the cloth. The procedure may then be repeated. The water is usually applied from a canteen cup or small watering can with a spout. You have orally informed us that this procedure triggers an automatic physiological sensation of drowning that the individual cannot control, even though he may be aware that he is in fact not drowning. You have also orally informed us that it is likely that this procedure would not last more than 20 minutes in any one application. I was then dragged from the small box, unable to walk properly, and put on what looked like a hospital bed and strapped down very tightly with belts. A black cloth was then placed over my face, and the interrogators used a mineral water bottle to pour water on the cloth so that I could not breathe. After a few minutes, the cloth was removed and the bed was rotated into an upright position. The pressure of the straps on my wounds was very painful. I vomited. The bed was then again lowered to a horizontal position, and the same torture carried out again with the black cloth over my face and water poured on from a bottle. On this occasion, my head was in a more backward, downward position, and the water was poured on for a longer time. I struggled against the straps, trying to breathe, but it was hopeless. I thought I was going to die. I lost control of my urine. Since then, I still lose control of my urine when under stress. In order for pain or suffering to rise to the level of torture, the statute requires that it be severe. Although the confinement boxes, both small and large, are physically uncomfortable, because their size restricts movement, they are not so small as to regulate, as to require the individual to contort his body to sit, small box, or stand, large box. You have also orally informed us that despite his wound, Zubaida remains quite flexible, which would substantially reduce any pain associated with being placed in the box. The facial slap and walling contain precautions to ensure that no pain, even approaching severe pain, results. The slap is delivered with fingers slightly spread, which you have explained to us is designed to be less painful than a closed hand slap. The slap is also delivered to the fleshy part of the face, further reducing any risk of physical damage or serious pain. Likewise, walling involves quickly pulling the person forward and then thrusting him against a flexible false wall. You have informed us that the sound of hitting the wall will actually be far worse than any possible injury to the individual. The use of the rolled towel around the neck also reduces the risk of injury. While it may hurt to be pushed against the wall, any pain experienced is not of the intensity associated with serious physical injury. I was then placed again in the tall box. While I was inside the box, loud music was played again, and somebody kept banging repeatedly on the box from the outside. I tried to sit down on the floor, but because of the small space, the bucket with urine tipped over and spilt over me. I remained in the box for several hours, maybe overnight. I was then taken out, and again a towel was wrapped around my neck, and I was smashed into the wall with the plywood covering and repeatedly slapped in the face by the same two interrogators as before. I was then made to sit on the floor with a black hood over my head until the next session of torture began. As we understand it, when the waterboard is used, the subject's body responds as if the subject were drowning, even though the subject may be well aware that he is in fact not drowning. You have informed us that this, pr this procedure does not inflict actual physical harm. Thus, although the subject may experience the fear or panic associated with the feeling of drowning, the waterboard does not inflict physical pain. As we explained in the section 2340A memorandum, Pain and suffering, as used in section 2340, is best understood as a single concept, not distinct concepts of pain as distinguished from suffering. The waterboard, which inflicts no pain or actual harm whatsoever, 
does not, in our view, inflict severe pain or suffering. Even if one were to parse the statute more finely to attempt to treat suffering as a distinct concept, the waterboard could not be said to inflict severe suffering. The waterboard is simply a controlled acute episode, lacking the connotation of a protracted period of time generally given to suffering. This went on for approximately one week. During this time, the whole procedure was repeated five times. On each occasion, apart from one, I was suffocated once or twice and was put in the vertical position on the bed in between. On one occasion, the suffering, I'm sorry, on one occasion, the suffocation was repeated three times. I vomited each time I was put in the vertical position between the suffocation. During that week, I was not given any solid food. I was only given Ensure to drink. My head and beard were shaved every day. I collapsed and lost consciousness on several occasions. Eventually, the torture was stopped by the intervention of the doctor. I was told during this period that I was one of the first to receive these interrogation techniques, so no rules applied. I felt like they were experimenting and trying out techniques to be used later on other people. It was getting the chance to go to Afghanistan for like a few days, see the country, then come back. And the day that we arrived in Afghanistan is when the bombing started. And it was just, we didn't know what was going on. We were scared. There was bombs being dropped everywhere. The first reaction by seeing an American soldier is, you know, you think basically I'm saved by the bell, but which wasn't the case. You know, the first thing they, 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 they took us, they stripped us down uh, naked um, and they tied our hands behind our backs. A sack was put over our head. Guards would walk past and kick you and punch you. They want answers which you can't give them because you, you have no involvement in anything. And that, that, that kind of mental torture is a hundredfold worse than physical torture because you don't know what's going on. You, you're worried about your family, if they're alive, if they're okay, and you have no contact with them. You're sitting in this cell and w the only thing you can do is start hitting your head off the floor. Throughout our stay in Guantanamo, we were all, all physically and, and psychologically and sexually abused in many, many forms. And all detainees who, who went into integration and they were threatened to be sodomized, and all of detainees who went into integration and came back crying um, because of what had happened to them. You know, they were sexually abused by women and male, by men, interrogators, who would, you know, the women would come onto them and, and fill them up, you know, sexually. It's hard to understand when you are born in the West, you know, you talk about sexual, you know, when, when you talk about women trying to physically touch the male, most people in the West would think, well, what's wrong with that? But you have to, you have to take in consideration of where, the, what, where is that person from? What is his culture? It wasn't just a conflict between detainees and soldiers, it was between soldiers and soldiers as well. There's one group from Massachusetts that made our life hell a lot worse than anyone else could have. And there's a group from South Carolina that were like, that were like angels compared to them. But although they treated us bad, but they, they were a lot better than them. I think what made us kind of survive Guantanamo was the fact that we was young. And I think the second thing was because we, I was not there on my own. So anything that happened to me, I could relate to somebody that was very close to me. Being best friends from a, from a young age, you know, who else could you want in that kind of situation? We was never charged of any crime, um, never given an explanation why we were arrested in the first place. The first night I got home, I can remember waking up and sitting in my bed, still thinking that I was in Guantanamo and still waiting for the guard to actually bring me food to my, to my room. After sitting there for about half an hour, I realised I was in my bedroom. So, you know, what am I doing? Sitting there like an idiot. Within a 48-hour period, we were taken up out of a supermax prison and we were walking the streets of London. Why did I get released? I was made to feel like I was the worst of the worst. If I was so bad, why am I here? Hi, I'm Eve Ensler. And this is a statement by George W. Bush, June 26, 2004. Today on United Nations International Day in support of victims of torture, the United States reaffirms its commitment to the worldwide elimination of torture. 
Freedom from torture is an inalienable human right, and we are committed to building a world where human rights are respected and protected by the rule of law. America stands against and will not tolerate torture. We will investigate and prosecute all acts of torture and undertake to prevent other cruel and unusual punishment in all territory under our jurisdiction. American personnel are required to comply with all U.S. laws, including the United States Constitution, federal statutes, including statutes prohibiting torture and our treaty obligations with respect to the treatment of all detainees. The United States also remains steadfastly committed <laughs> to upholding the Geneva Conventions, which have been the bedrock of protection in armed conflict for more than 50 years. We expect other nations to treat our service members and civilians in accordance with the Geneva Conventions. Our armed forces are committed to complying with them and to holding accountable those in our military who do not. The American people were horrified by the abuse of detainees at Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. These acts were wrong. They were inconsistent with our policies and our values as a nation. I have directed a full accounting for the abuse of the Abu Ghraib detainees, and investigations are underway to review detention operations in Iraq and elsewhere. Despite international efforts to protect human rights around the world, repressive regimes continue to victimize people through torture. The victims often feel forgotten, but we will not forget them. America supports accountability and treatment centers for torture victims. We stand with the victims to seek their healing and recovery and urge all nations to join us in these efforts to restore the dignity of every person affected by torture. These times of increasing terror challenge the world. Terror organizations challenge our comfort and our principles. The United States will continue to take seriously the need to question terrorists who have information that can save lives, but we will not compromise the rule of law or the values and principles that make us strong. Torture is wrong no matter where it occurs, and the United States will continue to lead the fight to eliminate it everywhere. I'm George Saunders, and I'm going to read from a statement by Khaled El Masri, a German citizen born in Lebanon who was a car salesman in Germany uh, before he was detained in December 2003. Mr. El Masri writes, The U.S. policy of extraordinary rendition has a human face, and it is mine. I was born in Kuwait and raised in Lebanon. In 1985, I fled to Germany in search of a better life. I became a citizen and started my own family. I have five children. On December 31st, 2003, I took a bus from Germany to Macedonia. When we arrived, Macedonian agents confiscated my passport and detained me for 23 days. I was not allowed to contact anyone. I was forced to record a video saying I had been treated well. I was handcuffed, blindfolded, and taken to a building where I was severely beaten. My clothes were sliced from my body with a knife or scissors, and my underwear was forcibly removed. I was thrown to the floor, my hands pulled behind me, a boot placed on my back. When my blindfold was removed, I saw men dressed in black wearing ski masks. I was put in a diaper, a belt with chains to my wrists and ankles, earmuffs, iPads, a blindfold, and a hood. I was thrown into a plane, my legs and arms spread-eagled and secured to the floor. I felt two injections and became nearly unconscious. I felt the plane take off, land, and take off again. When we landed, I was beaten and left in a dirty and cold concrete cell with a bottle of putrid water. I was taken to an interrogation room where I saw men dressed in the same black clothing and ski masks as before. They stripped and photographed me and took blood and urine samples. I was returned to the cell. The following night, my interrogations began. They asked me if I knew why I had been detained. I did not. They told me I was now in a country with no laws. And did I understand what that meant? They asked me many times whether I knew the men who were responsible for the September 11th attacks. 
if I had traveled to Afghanistan and if I associated with certain people in Germany. I, I told the truth that I'd never been in Afghanistan and had never been involved in any extremism. I asked repeatedly to meet with a representative of the German government or a lawyer or, or to be brought before a court. My requests were ignored. In desperation, I began a hunger strike. After 27 days without food, I was taken to meet with two Americans, the prison director and another man referred to as the boss. I pleaded with them to release me or bring me before a court, but the prison director replied that he could not release me without permission from Washington. He also said he believed I should not be detained in the prison. After 37 days without food, I was dragged to the interrogation room where a feeding tube was forced through my nose into my stomach. I became extremely ill. I was taken to meet an American who said he had traveled from Washington and who promised I would soon be released. I was also visited by a German-speaking man who explained that I would be allowed to return home but warned that I was never to mention what had happened because the Americans were determined to keep it secret. Almost five months after I was kidnapped, I was again blindfolded, handcuffed, and chained to an airplane seat. I was told we would land in a country other than Germany, but that I would eventually get to Germany. After we landed, I was driven into the mountains. My captors removed my handcuffs and blindfold and told me to walk down a dark, deserted path and not look back. I was afraid I would be shot in the back. I turned to bend and encountered three men who asked why I was illegally in Albania. They took me to the airport where I bought a ticket home. My wallet had been returned to me. I had long hair, a beard, and had lost 60 pounds. My wife and children, my wife and children had gone to Lebanon, believing I had abandoned them. We are now together again in Germany. I still don't know why this happened to me. I have been told that the American Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice, confirmed in a meeting with the German Chancellor that my case was a mistake, and that American officials later denied she said this. No one from the American government has ever contacted me or offered me any explanation or apology for the pain they caused me. I experienced sadness in a state that I never have, uh, cruelty in a depth that I never seen in my life. But you will not leave a similar person anymore. You live as broken, physically broken, psychologically broken wretches. You wouldn't even dream of it or feel it unless you're really subjected to it. I could tell you, you know, just imagine yourself sleeping under light, glaring light for six years. What will that do to you? You could imagine it, but you would not really feel how breaking it is to the mind unless you live underneath that kind of system. When you have a hole like that and then you have an AC which is in full blow of air, cold air coming out into it, you're living inside a fridge. You locked up. I used to remember, you know, I worked in Burger King's when I was a student for, for studies and stuff. I used to remember walking into Burger King's fridge to get stuff out. It was like that. And they had a system after system. It was continuous. It was like you never had resting in town for six years. They had elastics, goggles were really, really tight. You can see the blood was, you can feel your head blowing up because of the blood was holding, holding back between this area to this area. And um, you had no senses, your nose was covered, your ears were covered, they were very uncomfortable, your hands were like that, and sometimes they drown you with water. This is the closest we came to waterboarding. Is they, they, they do water where you suffocate, they put lots of water until you scream. They spray you with something that makes you really burn everywhere, your face, everything. And they'd be laughing. Sometimes they'd pass and hit you with the electric gun if they wanted, sometimes, and they'd laugh about that. We were never legally accused of anything. We were subjected to all sorts of barbarian kind of treatment, humiliation, disgrace, uh, torture, and so on. And we were never, we were released without any charges, without anything, no apologies, nothing. No, that, that doesn't mean that I held grudge against every American. No, I want the people themselves, the humans in America, the good people which I met many of, to realize how in their names those ugly people have done to others. Many of the interviewers have approached us for help, and in other cases we've asked if we could sit in to see new detainees, etc., and no one has said no yet. Seem to have been well received by most interviewers. 
interesting differences between the interviewees as well as interview styles, and definitely areas where I feel we've contributed. We're still hearing about folks doing weird things like subjecting interviewees to strobe lights, etc., but have not seen anything of concern to date. Overheard a very loud, non-bureau interview down the hall yesterday, but chose not to observe it. On the personal front, have seen two movies at the outdoor theater, Matrix Reloaded and Bruce Almighty. Definitely a must-see. Censored. There's even a monkey scene for, in it for you. There was a bonfire beach party last Friday and a pool party on Saturday night. We have an offer to go sailing this Sunday, not sure of going yet. Friday, July 30th, 2004, subject Gitmo, censored. Following a detainee interview, exact date unknown, while leaving the interview building at Camp Delta at approximately 8.30 p.m. or later, I heard and observed in the hallway loud music and flashes of light. I walked from the hallway into the open door of a monitoring room to see what was going on. From the monitoring room, I looked inside the adjacent interview room. At that time, I saw another detainee sitting on the floor of the interview room with an Israeli flag draped around him, loud music being played, and a strobe light flashing. I left the monitoring room immediately after seeing this activity. I did not see any other persons inside the interview room with the Israeli flag-draped detainee, but suspect this was a practice used by the DOD DHS, since the only other persons inside the hallway near the particular in this particular interview room were dressed in green military fatigues. I understood prior to deployment to Gitmo that such techniques were not allowed nor approved by FBI policy. Monday, May 10th, 2004, subject, instructions to Gitmo interrogators, TJ. We did advise each supervisor that went to Gitmo to stay in line with bureau policy and not deviate from that, censored. We had also met with Generals Dunleavy and Miller explaining our position, law enforcement techniques, versus Department of Defense. Both agreed the bureau has their way of doing business and DOD has their marching orders from the Secretary of Defense. In my weekly meetings with DOJ, J, we often discussed censored, techniques, and how they were not effective or producing intel that was reliable. Our specific example was censored. Once the Bureau provided DOD with the findings, censored, they wanted to pursue expeditiously their methods to get more out of him, censored. We were given a so-called deadline to use our traditional methods. Once our timeline, censored, was up, censored, took the reins. We stepped out of the picture and censored, ran the operation, censored. FBI did not participate at the direction of myself, censored, and BAUUC, censored. Bottom line is FBI personnel have not been involved in any methods of interrogations that deviate from our policy. The specific guidance we have given has always been no Miranda. Otherwise, follow FBI DOJ policy just as you would in your field office. Use common sense. Utilize our methods that are proven. Saturday, October 26, 2002. Subject, Gitmo update. Hello all. Censored is gone and I am here. Censored. You made quite an impression and have left big shoes to fill. First impressions. It is hot here. I brought too much luggage. The learning curve is vertical. The more you read about Islam and our friends here, the better off you'll be once you get here. Many different agendas here, and you have to use all your behavioral skills to pull it all together and keep your finger on the pulse. No one will lead you by the hand. Did I mention that it is hot here? Later. Monday, July 12, 2004, subject Gitmo, Mr. Censored. I'm responding to your request for feedback on aggressive treatment and improper interview techniques used on detainees. I did observe treatment that was not only aggressive, but personally very upsetting, although I can't say that this treatment was perpetrated by bureau employees. It seemed that these techniques were being employed by the military, government contract employees, and censored. Friday, December 5, 2003, subject, impersonating FBI at Gitmo. 
I am forwarding this EC up the CDD chain of command. MLDU requested this information be documented to protect the FBI. MLDU has had a long-standing and documented position against the use of some DOD's interrogation practices. However, we're not aware of these latest techniques until recently. Of concern, DOD interrogators impersonating supervisory special agents of the FBI told a detainee that censored. These same interrogation teams then censored. The, the detainee was also told by this interrogation team, censored. These tactics have produced no intelligence of a threat neutralization nature to date, and CITF believes that techniques have destroyed any chance of prosecuting this detainee. If this detainee is released or, or his story made public in any way, DOD interrogators will not be held accountable because these torture techniques were done by the quote unquote FBI interrogators. The FBI will be left holding the bag before the public. I'm A.M. Holmes. And I'm Jack Rice. And we will be reading excerpts from the interrogation of log of detainee 063. This 83-page document logs the minute-by-minute, seven-week interrogation of Muhammad al Qatani, which took place from November 2002 to January 2003 at Camp X-Ray, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. I'm a former CIA officer and a journalist. I'm just back from Guantanamo Bay. Before I received this reading to do, I was at Camp X-Ray. A week and a half ago, I was in these interrogation rooms. So when I received this, uh, it hit me a little bit harder than I expected. 13 December 2002. One minute after midnight, upon entering the booth, Lead played the call to prayer with a special alarm clock. Detainee was told, this is no longer the call to prayer. You're not allowed to pray. This is a call to interrogation, so pay attention. Both Lead and Control participated in a pride and ego down approach. Control told Islam, UBL, Osama bin Laden, has made a whore of Islam. Since you follow Osama bin Laden, you also rape Islam. Control put a sign on detainee that had the Arabic word for coward written on it. Explain how the word liar, stupid, weak, and failure apply to detainee. Detainee showed very little emotion during the initial portion of the session, except for the occasional smug smile that was met with immediate taunts and ridicule from the interrogators. O120, lead ordered detainee to go to bathroom and walk for 20 minutes, refuse water. Corpsman checked his vital signs and stated he was fine. Both inter interrogators continued with the futility and pride and ego down approaches. On occasion, when the detainee began to drift off into sleep, Lee dripped a couple of drops of water on detainee's head to keep him awake. Detainee jerked violently in his chair each time. 0240. After a bathroom and walking break and detainee's refusal of water, the interrogators continued the aforementioned approaches. Detainee showed little response during this session. Detainee became increasingly tired and incoherent. O320. Detainee received walking and bathroom break, refused water. He then slept for one hour, followed by one hour in his chair, listening to white noise. O530. Control showed detainee the banana rats and stated that they live better than he does. By the way, they're about this long. Lead asked detainee, what do you think is going to happen to you? What would a judge do if he saw all of the information that links you to Al-Qaeda? Detainee stated, I'm not associated with Al-Qaeda. After that statement, control read all the circumstantial evidence collected against detainee. Detainee attempted to hide his emotions, but was clearly frightened when asked if the judge had enough evidence to convict him. 0700, detainee walked refused water, and allowed to begin four-hour rest period. 1100, detainee awakened and offered coffee, refused. 1115, detainee taken to bathroom and walked 10 minutes, offered water, refused. Interrogators began telling detainee how ungrateful and grumpy he was. In order to escalate the detainee's emotions, a mask was made from an MRE box with a smiley face on it and placed on the detainee's head for a few moments. A latex glove was inflated and labeled the sissy slap glove. 
The glove was touched to the detainee's face periodically after explaining the terminology to him. The mask was placed back on the detainee's head. While wearing the mask, the team began dance instruction with the detainee. The detainee became agitated and began shouting. The mask was removed and detainee was allowed to sit. Detainee shouted and addressed Lead as, quote, oldest Christian here and wanted to know why Lead would allow detainee to be treated in this way. 1300, 1 p.m. Detainee taken to bathroom and walked 10 minutes. 1320, detainee offered food and water, refused. Detainee was unresponsive for remainder of a session. Afghanistan Taliban themes run for remainder of session. 1430, detainee was taken to bathroom and walked 10 minutes. 1500, detainee offered water, refused. 1510, Corman changed bandages on ankles, checked vitals, okay. 1530, detainee taken to bathroom and walked 10 minutes. 1600, Corman checks vitals and starts IV. Detainee gives three bags of IV. 1745, detainee taken to bathroom and walked 10 minutes. 1800, detainee was unresponsive. 1833, detainee was allowed to sleep. 1935, the detainee was awakened by interrogation team. He was offered food and water, but he refused. 1945, the interrogation team and detainee watched the video, Operation Enduring Freedom. 2120, detainee was sent to the latrine, latrine, offered water, but he refused. 2200, detainee exercised for good health and circulation. Medical representative took detainee's vital signs and removed the IV housing unit from detainee's arm. Detainee's pulse rate was low, 38, and his blood pressure high, 144 over 90. Detainee complained of having a boil on his left leg just below his knee. The medical representative looked at the leg and phoned the doctor. The doctor instructed the corpsman to recheck the detainee's vitals in one hour. 2300, detainee refused water and food. He was taken to, lat to latrine and exercised in order to assist in improving the detainee's vital signs. 2345, the medical representative rechecked the detainee's vital signs. The detainee's blood pressure had improved, was still high, 138 over 80, and his pulse rate had improved but remained low, 42. The corpsman called the doctor to provide an update, and the doctor said operations should continue since there had been no significant change. It was noted that historically the detainee's pulse sometimes drops into 40s in the evenings. Hello, I am Matthew Alexander. And I'm Amrit Singh. We are reading an excerpted transcript of former CIA director George Tenet's 60 Minutes appearance in April 2007. <clears throat> I will be reading the part of correspondent Scott Pelley. And I will be reading the part of George Tennant from a CBS News transcript of 60 Minutes, Sunday, April 29th, 2007. You know, the image that's been portrayed is that we sat around the campfire and said, oh boy, now we get to torture people. We don't torture people. Let me say that to you. We don't torture people, okay? Come on, George. We don't torture people. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed? We don't torture people. Waterboarding? We do not, I don't talk about techniques. It's torture. And we don't torture people. No, listen to me, listen to me. I want you to listen to me. So the context is it's post 9-11. I've got reports of nuclear weapons in New York City, apartment buildings that are going to be blown up, planes are going to fly into airports all over again, plot lines that I don't know. I don't know what's going on inside the United States. And I'm struggling to find out where the next disaster is going to occur. Everybody forgets one central context of what we lived through, the palpable fear that we felt on the basis of the fact that there was so much we did not know. I know that this program has saved lives. I know we've disrupted plots. But what you're essentially saying is that some people need to be tortured. No, I did not say that. You're, you're, not say you're that. telling me that I did not say the that. enhanced interrogation I did not say that. We do not torture. Listen to me. L look. Look, you're making an assumption. You called it in the book, enhanced interrogation techniques. Well, that's what we call it. I mean, that's a euphemism. I'm not having a semantic debate with you. I'm telling you what I believe. Anybody ever die in the interrogation program? No. You're sure of that? Yeah. In this program that you and I are talking have, about, Have you no. seen any of these interrogations done? No. Didn't you feel like it was your responsibility to know what you were signing off on? I understood. I'm not a voyeur. I understood what I was signing off on. Uh, 
I remember being spat at. I remember the dogs being brought so close to me that I could almost feel the saliva dropping off the dog's mouth. I uh, took a knife and ripped off my clothes. I could feel the cold blade gliding across my skin. And then being taken up um, naked, forcibly shaved. I was held for a total of three years. Three years without charge, without trial, without any explanation. Um, and I was released without charge, without trial and without any explanation. We moved and lived in the city of Kabul only for a few months, um, up until September 11th happened. Uh, I was, I think, playing a game on my computer in the middle of the night and just about to go to bed. Uh, the kids and the wife had already gone to sleep. And as I was about to turn in for the night, there was a knock on the door, so I found that very strange. And they stormed in, pushed their way in, and one of the guns raised towards my head. I was hooded. And just before they carried me away, I tried to say, please leave my family alone. Prisoner 421. And I remember his number because his back used to be towards me when his hands were tied up. He had slumped, his body had slumped. They had clearly put him there to break him, started punching him and then unshackled him, punching him to see if he was putting it on and then they dragged him away uh, and beat him some more and eventually he was killed. My experience of America prior to this was everything that I'd seen in the films. The concept of the good guys, the concept of um, people trying to do the right thing. And that was shattered. After my experience of Guantanamo, I felt that um, there's a word that really encapsulates what I think of American justice, oxymoron. What's really important, I think, for the United States of America, that if it wishes to reach a solution and end the type of arbitrary nature of detention and w warmongering that we saw under the Bush era, if people really want to see an end to that, then there needs to be an, a, a recognition that detention without trial is a fundamental principle that every developed, civilized nation should be against. I'm Paul Oster, and I'll be reading ex excerpts from a series of autopsy and death reports of detainees who died in U.S. custody in Iraq and Afghanistan. Autopsy number A03-51, date of death, June 6, 2003. The decedent is a 52-year-old Iraqi male, civilian detainee, who was found unresponsive outside in isolation at Whitehorse Detainment Facility. This 52-year-old male, redacted, died as a result of, a, of asphyxia, lack of oxygen to the brain, due to strangulation. Additional findings at autopsy include blunt force injuries, predominantly recent bruises, on the torso and lower extremities. The abrasions encircling the left wrist are consistent with the use of restraints. Cause of death, strangulation. Manner of death, homicide. Autopsy number ME03-504, date of death, November 4th, 2003. An Iraqi national died while detained at the Abu Ghraib prison where he was held for interrogations by government agencies. Fractures of the ribs and a contusion of the left lung imply significant blunt force injuries of the thorax and likely resulted in impaired respiration. Interviews taken from individuals present during the interrogation indicate that a hood was placed over the head and neck of the detainee. This likely resulted in further compromise of effective respiration. Cause of death blunt force injuries complicated by compromised respiration. Manner of death, homicide. Autopsy number ME03-571. Date of death, November 26, 2003. This Iraqi died while in US custody. The details surrounding the circumstances at the time of death are classified. Cause of death, asphyxia due to smothering and chest compression. Manner of death, homicide. Death, April 5, 2004, location LSA Damon. Questioned by NSWT, struggled, interrogated, died sleeping. Cause and manner pending. 
Death, January 1, 2004. Location, FOB Rifles. Question by other government agency, gagged and standing restraint. Cause, blunt force injuries and asphyxia. Manner of death, homicide. Death, 2000, uh, November 26, 2004. Location, FOB Tiger. Question by military intelligence, died during interrogation. Cause, asphyxia due to smothering and chest compression. Manner of death, homicide. Death, November 4, 2003, location Abu Ghraib. Questioned by other government agency and NSWT, died during interrogation. Cause, blunt force injury complicated by compromised respiration. Manner of death, homicide. Death, December 10, 2002, location Bagram, Afghanistan, found unresponsive in cell cause blunt force injuries to lower extremities, manner of death, homicide. Death, December 3, 2002, location Bagram, Afghanistan, found unresponsive, restrained in his cell, cause pulmonary embolism due to blunt force injuries to the legs, manner of death, homicide. Autopsy number ME04-14, date of death, January 9, 2004. Iraqi detainee died while in U.S. custody. This 47-year-old white male died of blunt force injuries and asphyxia. The autopsy disclosed multiple blunt force injuries, including deep contusions of the chest wall, numerous displaced rib fractures, lung contusions, and hemorrhage into the intestine. The decedent was shackled to the top of a door frame with a gag in his mouth at the time he lost consciousness and became pulseless. The severe blunt force injuries, the hanging position, and the obstruction of the oral cavity with a gag contributed to this individual's death. The manner of death is homicide. Um, my name is Susanna Moore. I'm reading the testimony of an Algerian gentleman named Mustafa. And I'm Amrit Singh, and uh, I'm the tribunal president in these proceedings. And I'm Matthew Alexander. I'm going to read the part of the recorder. Is it your plan to go through each allegation? Yes. Recorder, read each one aloud and allow the, the detainee to respond to each allegation. Item 2.A.1. The detainee is Algerian, but acquired Bosnian citizen, citizenship by serving in the Bosnian army in 1995. Is this the first accusation? Yes. As I said to my personal representative earlier, I have some papers that were with me when I was transferred over here. They could not find those papers. The papers proved I was not living in Bosnia in 1995. I acquired the citizenship while living in Croatia in February 1995. I entered Bosnia, if I remember correctly, in July or August, about two or three months before the war ended. I am going to give you proof I was living in Croatia. In the year 1995, Croatia divided into two parts, Jupania and Dalmatia. I was the martial arts champ in Dalmatia in 1995. The certificate that says I won the championship is probably still in my house. It even has the date on it. Can we move on to the second point? The detainee is associated with the armed Islamic group GIA. I don't want to ask you about the evidence because you said the evidence was classified. If you have any evidence, you can tell me. It is no problem. I am going to tell you, and if you have any evidence, you can tell that to me. Are you responding to that with a yes or no? Of course, no. What proves that is, if I was with the Algerian armed group, I would not have been able to go to the Algerian embassy. When my Algerian passport had expired, I had to go to the embassy to renew it. I had to hand in registration papers, which they take and send to the interior ministry in Algeria. The interior ministry sends those papers to the area where I lived in Algeria to verify all the information. 
So if I had any relationship with an armed group or drugs or weapons or anything, the response to the Algerian embassy would be not to register me. I can tell you that I am not a member of this group. You can contact Algeria and ask them. Let's respond to the next one, 3A3. Item 3A3. GIA is a recognized extremist organization with times, ties to Al-Qaeda. How can I respond to this? It is not a question and it is not an accusation. You're right. Let's move on to the next one. <laughs> Item 3A.4. While living in Bosnia, the detainee associated with a known Al-Qaeda operative. Give me his name. I do not know. How can I respond to this? Did you know of anybody that was a member of Al-Qaeda? No, no. No? No. This is something the interrogators told me a long while ago. I asked the interrogators to tell me who this person was. Then I could tell you if I might have known this person but not if the person is a terrorist. Maybe I knew this person as a friend. Maybe it was a person that worked with me. Maybe it was a person that was on my martial arts team. But I do not know if this person is Bosnia, Indian, or whatever. If you tell me the name, then I can respond and defend myself against this accusation. We are asking you the questions and we need you to respond to what is on the unclassified summary. If you say you did not know or that you did not know anyone that was part of Al-Qaeda, that is the information we need to know. I have only heard of Al-Qaeda after the attacks in the United States. Before that, I had never heard of Al-Qaeda. Even after I heard of Al-Qaeda, I felt that Al-Qaeda was the Taliban and the Taliban was Al-Qaeda. Then. After watching the news, I knew Al-Qaeda was associated with bin Laden and the Taliban was associated with the Afghans. Item 3.8.5. At the time of his capture, the detainee had planned to travel to Afghanistan once his Al-Qaeda contact arrived there and had made the necessary arrangements. I can respond to this accusation with a question. May I? Please do. Did they find any stamps or visas on my passport to any countries close to Afghanistan? Did they catch me with a suitcase on the plane? Was I seen going to an embassy for one of the countries close to Afghanistan? Was I seen sitting and talking with anyone known to be a part of Al-Qaeda? How can they know that I planned? I do not know how they can know this. Do you have anything that is clear or proves clearly that I planned these things? The answer that I'm able to give you is just to tell you that I did not plan these things, but I do not have any papers or anything to prove that. Item 3.B.1. The detainee was arrested by Bosnian authorities on 18 October 2001. Yes, but this phrase, arrested by, I just want to make very clear that I was not arrested. I was in my house and they told me to come with them so they could ask me some questions. Item 3.B.2, the detainee was arrested because of his involvement with a plan to attack the U.S. Embassy located in Sarajevo. The same answer as before. The only thing I can tell you is I did not plan or even think of that. Did you find any explosives with me? Any weapons? Did you find me in front of the embassy? Did I threaten anyone? I am prepared now to tell you if you have anything or any evidence, even if it is just very little that proves I went to the embassy and looked like that, then I am ready to be punished. I can just tell you that I did not plan anything. These accusations, my answer to all of them is I did not do these things, but I do not have anything to prove this. Mustafa, does that conclude your statement? That is it, but I was hoping you had evidence that you can give me. If I was in your place, and I apologize in advance for these words, but if a supervisor came to me and showed me accusations like these, I would take the accusations and I would hit him in the face with them. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
we had to laugh, but it's okay. Good evening. I am Ishmael Beer. I will be reading an excerpt from a 14-page declaration of Lieutenant Colonel Darrell Vandervelt, Army Reserve Judge Advocate and former lead prosecutor in the Military Commission case of Guantanamo detainee Mohamed Jawad. Vandervelt removed himself from the case on ethical grounds and submitted this sworn statement in support of Jawad's habeas petition, which was filed by the ACLU. I, Darrell Vandervelt, declares as follows. I am Lieutenant Colonel in the Judge Advocate General Corps. Since the September 2001 attacks, I have served in Bosnia, Iraq, and Afghanistan. My awards include the Bronze Star Medal, the Iraqi Campaign Medal, and two Joint Meritorious Unit Awards. I offer this declaration in support of Mohammed Jawa's petition for habeas corpus. I was the lead prosecutor to the military commission's case against Mr. Jawad until my resignation in September 2008. Initially, the case appeared to be as simple as the street crimes had prosecuted by the dozens in civilian life. But eventually, I began to harbor serious doubts about the strength of the evidence. Mr. Jawad was alleged to have thrown a grenade at US troops, but the victims of the attack had not seen the attacker. At least three other Afghans had been arrested for the crime and had subsequently confessed, casting considerable doubt on the claim that Mr. Jawad was solely responsible for the attack. And I learned that the written statement characterized as Jawad's personal confession could not possibly have been written by him because Jawad was functionally illiterate and could not read or write. The statements was not even in his native language. I also found evidence that Mr. Jawad had been badly mistreated by US authorities, both in Afghanistan and Guantanamo. Mr. Jawad's prison records referred to a suicide attempt, a suicide which he sought to accomplish by banging his head repeatedly against one of his cell walls. The records reflected 112 unexplained moves from cell to cell over a two-week period, an average of eight moves per day for 14 days. Mr. Jawad had been subjected to a sleep deprivation program known as the Frequent Flyer Program. I lack the words to express the heart sickness I experienced when I came to understand the pointless, purely gratuitous mistreatment of Mr. Jawad by my fellow soldiers. It is my opinion, based on my extensive knowledge of the case, that there is no credible evidence or legal basis to justify Mr. Jawad's detention in US custody or his prosecution by military commission. Holding Mr. Jawad for six years with no resolution of his case and with no terminus in sight is something beyond travesty. I have taken an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States, and I remain confident that I have done so, spending over four of the past seven years away from my family, my home, my civilian occupation, all without any expectation of or desire for any award greater than the knowledge that I have remained true to my word and have done my level best to rise to the nation's defense in its time of need. I did not quit the military commissions or resign. Instead, I personally petitioned the Army's Judge Advocate General to allow me to serve the remaining six months of my two-year voluntary obligation in Afghanistan or Iraq. In the exercise of his wisdom and discretion, he permitted me to be released from active duty. However, had I been returned to Afghanistan or Iraq, and had encountered Mohammed Jawad in either of those hostile lands where two of my friends have been killed in action and another one of my very best friends was terribly wounded, I have no doubt at all, none, that Mr. Jawad would pose no threat whatsoever to me, his former prosecutor and now repentant prosecutor. 
Six years is a long enough for a boy of 16 to serve in virtual solitary confinement in a distant land for reasons he may never fully understand. Mr. Jawad should be released to resume his life in a civil society for his sake and for our own sense of justice and perhaps to restore a measure of our basic humanity. We didn't uh, do this just to depress you. Um, we think that it's important that you do something. And we propose some things that you can do. You can go to the pen.org website or to the ACLU website. You can look on the, at the sample letter on the membership table, take it home, think about who you should send it to in our government. Because uh, when we do do something, it makes a difference. Mohammed Jawad was released. Sorry. <laughs> Mohammed Jawad was released in August this year. He's now at home with his family in Afghanistan, where he should have been all along. As Anthony says, you can um, find out more about all of this at, at Penn's website uh, and the ACLU's website. We have, uh, we have a whole slew of actions that you can take if you want to, if you want to help us uh, end, end torture uh, and bring a measure of accountability, uh, which has been denied thus far. Uh, there are some books that are for sale at the back. There are also some materials that are on the table, free materials uh, on the table back there. Thanks again for, for coming. We hope that you'll support us in the future.